Well, welcome everybody. My name is Josh Humphreys, President, Senior Fellow of Croy Tan Institute, Independent Nonprofit Research Institute, whose mission is to harness the power of investment for social good and ecological resilience. And I'm really pleased to welcome everyone to this special renewable energy investment roundtable that we are organizing as part of the Clean Portfolio Project. Um, and I'm really excited to do it here at Greentown Labs uh, in Somerville, Massachusetts, uh, with a a live webinar going on simultaneously for those of you who could not join us today in person. Um, Greentown Labs, um, I can't say too much about it, but it's really exciting to do it. Our, our friends at Sunwell have uh, generously hosted us here. And for those of you who are participating in the roundtable component, please plan to stick around um, as we're going to do a, uh, a tour of what really is the nation's uh, largest and most dynamic clean tech accelerator. Um, including the opportunity to visit one of the, the solar installations that the Sunwell team have put together. So it's really exciting uh, for those of you who are here in person. So please plan to join us for that tour, uh, which will begin at 4.30 following reception here. For those of you who are online, uh, we're going to take the first hour and a half uh, to share with you the, the actual in-person dialogue um, as part of the roundtable. And with that, what I'd like to do is to say a few words about the Clean Portfolio Project and uh, give brief introductions of our primary participants in the roundtable, um, whom we're really excited to welcome as well. So the Clean Portfolio Project is uh, an interesting initiative that emerged out of the social capital markets community in 2015. And um, the basic idea was that there was a gap at the time uh, between the rapidly growing fossil fuel divestment movement and the um, equally rapidly growing impact investing space. And as many of you may know, um, SOCAP, as it's known, um, has <coughs> one of the largest convening, um, convenings of impact investors um, with an annual meeting in San Francisco. And so what we did at the Institute was advise the SOCAP team on the first uh, divest and best track of content at SOCAP in 2015. In 2016, um, we um, actually continued to do work within the community, uh, formalized the work into um, a project that put forward a series of model educational uh, resources, including constructing um, educational portfolios that would highlight that um, opportunities associated with, uh, with divesting from fossil fuels is not just about selling, but also about investing in solutions to climate change. Um, and to do so in ways that are diversified for the needs of the kinds of institutional investors that were beginning to make commitments to um, not only divest from fossil, fossil fuels, but invest in solutions to climate change. At the time, um, some college endowments had made commitments, um, and indeed in 2014, you know, a very thoughtful group of philanthropic foundations associated with divest and best philanthropy had also uh, started to make very substantial commitments, both to divest and to invest. <laughs> Um, but there was a pretty wide recognition within the field that um, on the invest side that folks lacked resources to really reallocate positions. Um, and so our advice within this context was to take a total portfolio approach to thinking about gaps and opportunities in the climate solutions investing space. And so the first portfolio we constructed and, and launched at SOCAP 16 um, from the main stage and with a dedicated panel um, was called the Divest and Best Clean 15, which just highlighted that across a wide range of asset classes, uh, public equity, fixed income, private debt and private equity, real assets across timberland, farmland, real estate, that there were emerging opportunities to invest in, in instruments and strategies that were free of fossil fuels, but also invested in climate solutions. Um, since that time, the project has kind of been taken back from, from SOCAP with transformations going on within the SOCAP community. Um, and now the Institute really manages and coordinates the project with a growing group of collaborative sponsors. Um, and uh, I'm really delighted to have several of those folks here. Um, but this gives you a sense of um, dozens of different groups that have um, joined with us in this effort to help fund the research and convenings that, that we've done. And uh, we've done them in San Francisco. Um, with the Sierra Club Foundation, Farmland LP. Uh, we've done them at SOCAP 365 events in New York, uh, at the Impact Hub in New York, and now this is the first time we've done an in-person convening in the Boston area, so we're really excited to, to do that here. 
And we're very interested in continuing to nourish these kinds of conversations around the country in other places, and always interested in, in um, looking for partners to do that. And obviously here, my fellow roundtable uh, contributors are all from the Boston area, um, so it's great to be able to highlight um, you know, the, the very strong density and sort of concentration of folks who are working on both fossil free investing strategies and solutions to, to climate change. Um, I think one other facet that's novel this year for the Clean Portfolio Project is that in addition to putting out resources and doing in-person events at conferences and in small uh, investor-focused um, convenings, we also now have launched a webinar series this year in which we're beginning to work thematically through different solutions to climate change. Um, the first was in January, focused on regenerative uh, food and ag, um, and this in a way by bringing together both the in-person investor um, focused event as, as well as the webinar is, is continuing that. So this is the second thematic uh, webinar focused on renewable energy. Um, Christy, I don't know if there's a slide related to the themes of the, the initial project. Um, Josh, did you want to mention? Yeah. Mention the, mention the forum. Yeah, I guess that's another place in which we've done an in-person convening is the, the Croatan Forum. This is a new, a new initiative. We had our first one in Durham, North Carolina, the Research Triangle area, where our core team is based uh, in the fall of last year. And indeed, uh, folks from the Sunwealth team, as well as some of um, some of our other active participants, participated in a session at uh, the, the Croatan Forum dedicated to the Clean Portfolio Project as a theme with um, a focus on investing in a just transition in particular, that is to say integrating you know, social equity considerations into the clean energy transition. And it's a theme that's going to recur in our conversation today as well. Um, and we're really excited to continue to use the forum as one of multiple platforms in which we're um, in engaging with people interested in solutions to climate change um, and those involved in the Clean Portfolio Project. Our next one, as the slide suggests, is going to be in the spring of 2020. So please plan to join us if you'd like. I guess, Christy, it's worth saying uh, to the next uh, the next slide that, you know, we're obviously talking about investment in finance, and because of that, it's a regulated industry. And so we should make you know, really clear that what we're doing today is by no means uh, a set of um, recommendations for investment. This is by no means a solicitation. This is not a marketing event for any particular product or fund. What we're doing as a nonprofit at the Institute and in the Clean Portfolio Project is helping people in the field who are interested in reallocating capital understand the opportunity set as they're emerging across asset classes. That's really the point of this. And a similar note is that when we construct portfolios, um, the sponsors have nothing to do with that. And we have a, an independent process. So this is by no means a kind of pay to play initiative. You know, um, nobody here is a broker dealer um, and nobody's here making pitches um, to be quite transparent and explicit about that. Um, this is really to help people understand the panoply of options that are beginning to emerge. And we welcome the participation of other kinds of fund managers, broker dealers, advisors, asset owners and other kindred nonprofits who have already been very actively involved in this work. So I mentioned at SOCAP 16, we launched the Divest Invest Clean 15, um, which provided for five sets of asset classes, um, a series of best in class um, opportunity sets that had institutional character for being competitively benchmarked within their asset class, that also had social impact features, social impact reporting features in addition to providing fossil-free climate solutions. Um, and so we continue to work off of this basic premise of, of thinking about multiple asset classes as a framework, total portfolio approaches to investing in climate solutions. And as we move forward, our hope is, in fact, to, to extend beyond this initial set of five asset classes into areas that are growing, hedge funds, private debt, um, exploding the real assets case, and dealing with infrastructure, and also cash, which is missing here, in addition to some of the other esoteric alternative asset classes. And the next slide um, highlights, at least for the initial clean portfolio that was developed, 10 climate solutions themes uh, on which the project has focused heretofore. And so just to run through those, it ranges from clean technology and resilient community development to just pure environmental finance, green building in the built environment, 
uh, renewable energy, which is obviously our focus thematically today, um, as well as energy efficiency and other um, ways to, to think about supporting the renewable energy marketplace. And in sustainable food and ag, forestry and timberland, uh, sustainable transport and smart growth, sustainable corporate work broadly, and then clean and sustainable water systems. Those are the first 10 uh, solutions areas that we're really focusing on the project. And again, as this project evolves, you know, we certainly welcome additional opportunities to explore um, new themes as they're arising in the climate solutions space. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to open this up a bit more fully to actual roundtable discussion with our speakers. Um, so there are a half dozen folks who are joining me today in, in the core part of the conversation that we're facilitating. And I just want to thank everybody, all of you, for, for joining us here. Um, we're going to begin with, uh, with Lindsay White uh, from Ceres. And Lindsay is the Senior Manager of the Ceres Investor Network on Climate Risk and Sustainability. And um, I'm not going to go through and, and um, belabor everybody's bio, but um, I know that Lindsay is very active in the, in the Boston chapter of WISE, um, a community of practice. Uh, focus on women investing that we're really excited also to, you know, to be allied with in, in a variety of our different initiatives when it comes to diversity. Um, and to my immediate left here is um, Elizabeth Levy from Trillium Asset Management, where she's a senior vice president, portfolio manager, and research analyst focusing on, on renewables. And she also leads both um, the, the all-cap core and fossil-free core strategies. Um, at Trillium in public equities. Um, Peter Kaufman, to my far left, is the president and um, a lead portfolio manager at Breckenridge Capital Advisors, um, a major bond fund manager, uh, which also has concerted fossil free strategies based here in Boston. Jonathan Abe, on my far left, is the CEO of Sunwealth. Um, so again, John, thanks so much for hosting us today. Really appreciate that. Um, and um, to Jonathan's left, actually, I believe, no, right to my immediate left is Johanna uh, Wilson, who's the co-founder and principal at Prime Impact Fund, which is a new early stage investment fund, um, deploying philanthropic capital into, into the renewable space. And then um, last but not least, we're going to hear from Ash Dixit from Athena Capital Advisors, uh, which is based out in Lincoln and Lexington um, here in the Boston area and uh, has its origins as a multifamily office now the leading investment advisor in the impact space. Um, and what's nice about this group, um, in addition to them all being from the Boston area, is that they also uh, provide really distinctive perspectives on this oppor opportunity set around renewables. So what we try to do today, as we often try to do in the project, is to have voices representing different kinds of asset owners, different kinds of asset classes, and other forms of intermediation. So today, in particular, what we have is um, the perspective that um, Lindsay is going to be bringing to us um, at first from broad, uh, a broad constellation of asset owners as well as asset managers. Um, but I think we're particularly interested in, in hearing um, about you know the the interest and um, curiosity on the part of asset owners uh, for getting exposure to this space. Um, and the work that they're doing at Ceres with a variety of other asset owning constellations and networks. Um, and then we're going to walk through a series of asset classes again. So each fund manager's uh, firm really has um, core expertise in a different asset class, as you've heard, public equity, fixed income, private debt, and tax equity financing on the Sunwell side, um, Johanna's team on the private equity side, but with a blended capital approach, you know, that, um, that uh, has a wide uh, spectrum of return profiles that we're going to be seeing here. Uh, and an ash coming from the total portfolio approach, really, the, the multi-asset class perspective of someone actually doing due diligence on funds and allocating capital across all of these asset classes. So we have a, a really interesting, kind of diverse array of points of view in this space. And so with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Christy, for hosting this event. And I wanted to add my words of thanks as well to our hosts at Greentown Labs and Sunwealth. I was actually in this location a year ago when Greentown Labs very kindly opened up what was then a, this new facility to the series conference for a conference program segment, uh, which John's colleague, uh, Ryan, who I think is just off camera, spoke at. So 
uh, great to be back here and just really exciting to see the growth of Greentown and uh, clearly a key part of the Clean Trillion Equation, which I will speak more about. So to dive in here, I'll be giving some framing remarks about <coughs> both series and then also about kind of the North Star that we're all focused on as we sit around the table today. So for those unfamiliar with series uh, in the room or uh, over the web, the series is a sustainability nonprofit organization headquartered here in Boston, and actually this is the 30th year this year of series founding. So what we do is we work with the world's most influential companies and investors to drive solutions and build leadership to create a truly sustainable global economy and a sustainable future for people and the planet. Now, as part of our work related to today's topic on renewable energy, so a series in 2014 released a seminal report titled The Clean Trillion. And The Clean Trillion is basically derived from the international energy agencies, um, now IRENA, their prediction in 2012 and their uh, estimation that we really needed to invest about an annual aggregate um, of about $1 trillion in global clean energy investment in order to stay below that two degrees Celsius uh, temperature raise over pre-industrial levels. So that was in 2012, uh, the year of the, that prediction, global clean energy investment according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance was tracking at about 276 trillion. And in the intervening years, it's still tracked at about a third of where we need to go towards that initial IEA or arena projection to stay below two degrees Celsius. So that's one trend just to keep in mind. Um, we do have a, a graph over there on the right that shows that total trend over time. And those uh, numbers, again, uh, sourced by Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, at the same time, there have been some other interesting trends in terms of our ability to reach that really critical goal. Um, one has been because of falling costs of some technologies. There's actually been a change in that target. So just recently, I think about a week ago, there were new numbers released that basically it, there has been shaved off about $10 trillion of that target. We now need to reach $115 trillion in aggregate by 2050 rather than 125 and that's due to the falling technology cost. Um, so that's positive. At the same time, the goalpost has all also, as we know, shifted. So instead of aiming for two degrees, what we're looking at is really aiming for that 1.5 degrees Celsius North Star. And the reason for that, of course, is the climate science, which um, we've known for a long time, uh, but coming into ever sharper focus as per the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's most recent report, detailing really what the impacts are and very much here now uh, as well as in the long term. So that just to set the stage for our conversation here today is, is what we're, we're really looking at. So the way that series approaches that goal is really from a couple of different perspectives. So the one we're here to talk about today is really the investor perspective. So looking at the investor network, I'm going to say a few words about, about that um, and just want to highlight um, we have a couple of members of the series investor network here at the table today. Uh, so Trillium and Breckenridge, uh, both longtime members, and then uh, Brian will not a member we work with closely. So uh, great to be among familiar faces. Uh, but the investor network has been around through uh, since 2003, so about 16 years now, a little over half of uh, series existence. And really the genesis of it was it was founded in 2003 at an investor summit at the United Nations headquarters in New York. At that time, it was founded with six founding pension funds. Fast forward to today, it includes 168 both asset owners and asset managers and about $26.2 trillion in aggregate AUM. And really the focus of the investor network is on topics such as renewable energy, climate solutions investment, also looking at policy advocacy, and then newer issues such as sustainable forestry, uh, and for a long time as well shareholder engagement. So really the commonality across this diverse set of asset owner and asset managers in both the US and Canada, we are North American focused, uh, really looking at sustainable investing and, and broad topics across that spectrum that are focused through a sustainability lens. Um, so just wanted to make one side note, series also does run a parallel corporate network uh, and also different elements of climate and energy work across uh, different sectors. And so all critical parts of the Clean Trillion Equation, for today's purposes, we are going to be talking about the investor approaches and that network. 
Um, so looking at that network, one of the working groups that we maintain, uh, to Josh's point on partnerships, uh, is a great partnership with the Intentional Endowments Network, and then also the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, and this is the Climate Solutions Investment Initiative. So this initiative is a newer initiative. It was uh, stood up in May 2017, so just about two years back. And the focus and purpose of it is really to help to catalyze increased investment in climate solutions, both by academic endowments and then also by faith-based asset owners, and all working towards that North Star and global imperative of reaching the clean trillion. Uh, so as uh, for our, our slide here, CSIA members are really taking leadership to consider climate-related investments, to think about inserting climate into their investment policy statements and 2020 goal settings, to collaborate with peers and to report then on those climate-related investments. So that's that one piece of the work that we're doing there. Um, our members across the board are showing great leadership from U.S. pension funds to foundations, family offices, academic endowments, and then many different actors uh, within our investor network. Uh, so I will uh, pause there um, and then open the floor to our more asset class by asset class uh, discussion on the roundtable. Um, but that's a, a basic summary of kind of the, the goal that we are all working towards on a global basis uh, here in Boston and uh, across the world. So thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Really appreciate it. I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And again, I'm also really glad to be here in Greentown Labs. I've never been here before. Um, I'm very excited to get to be here and thank, uh, thank both Grosan and Trilliam also. So for anyone who's not familiar with Trillium, we are one of the oldest investment managers exclusively focused on sustainable and responsible and impact investing. Our clients are split pretty evenly between individuals and endowments and other institutional clients. And Trillium invests across a range of asset classes, debt, community investments, increasingly in the private markets. Uh, and all of these asset classes interact with renewables. But as Josh mentioned, I spend my time in the public equity market, so that's the perspective that I'm representing today. So uh, a few weeks ago, I found a study that McKinsey had done for the Norwegian government that was published at the end of last year that uh, was talking about the amount of investment that was going to be needed between now and roughly 2050 to stay within our, uh, our climate boundaries. And so that study had found that there was going to be about 25% of this investment was going to be in the public equity market. So when somebody says to you investing in renewables or investing in preventing climate change, renewable energy <coughs> technology is often the first thing that comes to people's mind. But uh, what I really want to focus on is that pure plays are just the tip of the iceberg. So of that quarter of the total investment that's going to be in the public market, only 3% going to be in the pure play renewables. So we really need to take a broader view. I think everybody can understand what a solar panel manufacturer, for example, or a wind turbine component manufacturer is doing to combat climate change, uh, but there's lots of other public equity ways that we need to be thinking about it. So for example, uh, and I'm pretty much, I realize, going to be marching through the slide that Josh presented uh, at the beginning, linking to the other climate solutions theme. Uh, but energy efficiency, I, I think a lot of us know of that as well. Uh, so this is old school industrial companies that are helping to, for example, improve the buildings that already exist or the buildings that are going to be built over the coming decades to use less energy. Uh, enabling technologies such as smart heaters or uh, companies that are building out the electric grid, that's going to be so necessary to connect to all of these far flung wind turbines in particular that are going to be built all over the globe and all over the country. Um, a few areas that I've been getting interested in recently, the organizations and the companies that are purchasing renewable energy. So over the last 18 months in particular, we've been seeing the rise of corporate uh, power purchase agreements, CPAs, which is basically companies saying, I want to run off of clean energy, but my local utility doesn't necessarily offer it, and my roof isn't big enough to put on enough solar for myself. Can anybody help me out with that? Uh, so that has become an increasingly large portion of the clean energy that is being installed uh, in this country in particular. And the companies that are putting it up weren't interesting. Uh, two different chats. One is consumer-facing companies. I think it's somewhat obvious why they might want to. They know that their consumers are looking for green and sustainable brands. And so one of the things they want to talk about is that they are uh, powered by 100% renewable energy, for example. But also the technology companies 
who run massive data centers, which have massive energy appetites. So they are looking to lock in their energy costs, as well as show their employees and their own customers uh, that they also care about um, climate change. And increasingly, uh, one interesting group of companies that, that I'm looking at is the electric utilities. They see the writing on the wall. The grid of today is not the grid of tomorrow. So many of them are starting to turn towards renewables. Some of them are turning really slowly and maybe not ever actually going to do it, but there are some leaders out there, and so we can be looking at those companies as well. But as I mentioned, uh, according to this McKinsey study, it's only going to be about a quarter of the investment needed that's going to be in the public market. So I'm actually really interested to hear from the other asset classes today. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Really appreciate it. Uh, staying within the public market, so turn over to Peter Coffin from Breckenridge to talk about what's happening in fixed income. Thank you. Um, yes, staying in the public markets, but switching over to investment grade fixed income, which is our singular focus at Breckenridge. And um, we've been around 26 years, but we did not, in earnest, really commit um, to ESG and sustainable investing and impact investing until like, 2011. Um, but um, we've committed uh, in earnest. We're B Corp and Benefit Corp, and our analysts, we've got 16 of them, and this is what really drives them day to day. So um, one of the points I make on the fixed income side is sort of taking, going um, a little beyond <coughs> something that Jeremy Grantham is fond of saying, it is, it is, and he refers to sort of the scourge of the discount rate. The fact that there's sort of a market failure in pricing a lot of costs and risks that are long term, that most corporations don't really care about what's out there 25 years from now. So, what I take from that is that um, we tend to use a lower discount rate uh, in fixed income and investment grade fixed income, and we tend to have a longer duration view in our highest responsibility as investors and investment managers is, is sort of the sanctity, the preservation of capital. So we are looking out long. And, um, and I would argue that, you know, you look, when is this market failure going to remedy itself? Well, when investors start to more broadly, uh, uh, adequately and accurately price these risks and costs. Um, and it's, you know, when the market begins to um, begin to, as a consequence of that, to respond. And um, and I would suggest that it's probably uh, a fairly high probability that the fixed income market may be where we first see serious um, serious issues, uh, where where investors begin. Um, to, in a meaningful way, uh, direct their investments away from um, sectors or companies that um, are more susceptible to these future liabilities and costs. So, um, so what does Breckenridge do? Like, um, you know, we have for years done fossil fuel-free portfolios. We have about 730 million that we manage, that, um, and that's pretty straightforward. We um, use MSCI's um, screening tool, but we also um, have a lot of clients who want to go beyond that and do some customization. So that's, that's the, the best part. And our job there is try to, to the best of our abilities, um, um, assure that that does not represent, that, that screen does not represent a, um, a a market, a give up in market return, right? That um, that we can um, achieve returns that are consistent with our unconstrained portfolios. And um, I'm, ha I'm happy to stay, and I'm not advertising because our unconstrained portfolios might have terrible returns, but <coughs> the, <laughs> the constrained fossil fuel freeze um, have returns that are consistent with those. So, um, so that's kind of the divest part, and then on the invest part, um, we do much as Trillium and Liz described. That we're, you know, we're looking for leaders across industries and sectors. And I think it comes, you know, obviously greenhouse gas and renewables, 
we're paying close attention in the utility space and we buy a lot of utility bonds. Um, so we want to reward and direct capital and we do believe fundamentally that companies that are preparing for these challenges are less risky, right? And it's also not a bad thing and to see a management that's a little less preoccupied with quarter to quarter results and, and beginning to sort of accept and, and address these, these future challenges. Um, the other thing we tr do, which I know Trillium and plenty of others in this room do in different ways is we engage with companies. And, and that's the part that um, I actually get most excited about at Breckenridge because um, we're creditors, we're debt holders. So we have no vote, right? So um, we get management on the line and we have the opportunity to say, we have no, this isn't really advocacy. This is only us as an investor, as a creditor, um, trying to get a better handle on your policies and practices um, with you know renewables and greenhouse gases and a lot of other issues. Uh, because purely as an investor, uh, we think these factors are relevant material and uh, and that there's some risk out there that the market is not adequately pricing. So I like to say we punch way above our weight in that regard, just because companies aren't accustomed to that, um, to see it from a purely investment standpoint. And uh, so anyway, we're doing more of, a, more of it all the time. <clears throat> That's great. Thank you very much. And I know those of you didn't talk much about advocacy actually yeah, listed equities, although I think in the roundtable conversation we'll have an opportunity to revisit that question about the nature of not just shareholder engagement, but as we're getting to hear what, what we like to describe as the institute as really investor engagement that can really acknowledge the specificity of where you come within the capital markets, whether it's from an asset class perspective or from somewhere else within the financial value chain, because every investor has substantial voice when it comes to corporates as well as other issuers and other, um, other sponsors of instruments in which one may be able to invest, and that's going to look very differently in different asset classes. Um, so I'm excited to foster that conversation both here and more widely as we do. Um, from the public markets, I think we're now going to turn more into alternative asset classes in the private markets. and. John from uh, Sunwell is going to lead us into that endeavor. Sure. Thank you very much again for inviting us. And uh, we're a little younger than some of the other prestigious <laughs> organizations here, so we count our track records on quarters. <laughs> We've been around for 19 quarters. <laughs> for the next slide, uh, we can boast 17 quarters of target returns to our investors. And I think what you'll find is you learn more about the team, our investors, and our projects, that we are built to be a generational business to address generational problems. And so today we have done 78 solar projects that we fund and manage, and we fund these projects to the benefit of diverse and underserved communities. And we have 120 investors in our community and growing. And we currently have 16 projects under construction, including a 500 kilowatt project on top of the publicly traded REIT Equinix, which is one of the largest data center owners in the world. And so um, what I wanted to do was kind of summarize what does a clean energy just transition, to use ProTen's term, look like? And if you could please advance to the next slide. Yeah. So this is what it looks like from our perspective. On the left, you have Olive Knight, who is a low to moderate income homeowner, and she was unable to get financing for a solar project or qualify for one of the typical solar PPAs. So what we did through our solar access program is we lease her rooftop. We give her the opportunity to not only get clear and tangible and basically guaranteed savings through the life of our contract, give her options to own the system starting at year 10. And then what we don't provide to her in the form of energy savings, we sell to the Walton Woods Project, which owns all the land around the state park at Walton Pond. And then on the right, this is Dan McGrath. So 
Dan McGrath was raised in Winter Hill in Somerville. Single mother, he's the oldest in his family. He had started working at a very young age to support him. He graduated from Somerville High. And he got his electrical contractor's license. We've been working with Dan McGrath in his IBW shop out of Malden since, you know, for almost 19 quarters now. <laughs> <laughs> and we've grown with that organization. They do 10 to 15% of our installation work and they've grown from a team of five to over 20. And Dan McGrath, he remembers when this Greentown Labs was a makeup facility. And Dan McGrath and his team built the project on top of Greentown Labs. And I encourage everyone to go on the tour afterwards with my partner, Ryan Dix. So this is another example of what we call solar access. This is a project in Oakfield, New York, basically a rural portion of New York, it's a very red county. Uh, but here, we own and operate the system on top of the Oakfield Fire Department. This is a volunteer fire department. This fire department also doubles as the recreation center for that community. And so this is where the Mother's Day breakfast is gonna be soon, where they have the tractor pull, where the community gathers and uses the space. The other thing that's cool about this, in addition to providing savings for a very important organization and local jobs, is that here the fire department is taking a leadership role in a region where there isn't a lot of solar and showing the community that we can do solar. It's safe, it saves money, and you can too. And this project is on the banks of the Connecticut <coughs> River in the city of Holyoke. So here we straighten it out a little bit, but this is basically a two acre sloping piece of land that has very other, has limited use other than for a solar project. And here you have a 430 kilowatt solar project where we sell the power generated from this project to the Holyoke Housing Authority. And the Holyoke Housing Authority doesn't have the best credit, but this is again where we're inspired by the community that supports solar Holyoke Gas and Electric, which has the best credit rating in that community, stepped in and they're backstopping this deal. And finally, this is Father Edwin. This is at the blessing of our solar project that we did with our partner and uh, Greentown Lab resident, resident Energy. And this is a project on top of the Epiphany School in inner city Boston. And the Epiphany School, is a private school that's focused on providing a middle school and high school education to at-risk kids that graduate elementary school from low-income communities. And they provide them with all-day education and activities, three meals, basically health insurance, and mental health counseling and guidance counseling as well. And so this is an example where um, we worked with local partners to provide local jobs. They're providing edu energy savings to an important organization in the community. Unbeknownst to us, they also integrated into their curriculum. And so part of their STEM program involves the kids studying and learning from that solar project as well. So thank you. I again encourage everyone to go on the tour afterwards. I'm glad to be part of this panel. Great. Thanks, John. Really appreciate it. I'll turn it over to Johanna from Front. Great. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm already learning so much from uh, the panelists around me. So um, I'm here to talk about Prime, and uh, what we're doing at Prime and Prime Impact Fund is very early stage venture capital with a twist, and the twist is philanthropic. So we're actually marshalling philanthropic capital, primarily capital from the grant-making side of foundations and from donor-advised funds, so capital that's um, charitable in nature, taking a tax exemption, and using it in the style of venture capital. And so I'll explain why we do this, but what I think is interesting for this group is uh, to think about philanthropic capital enabling, uh, enabling renewable and climate relevant um, investments in other asset classes. So I'm gonna be essentially describing what is a case study for philanthropic capital in venture. Um, and what I'd love you all to think about, and maybe we chat um, afterwards is 
um, you know, what else can philanthropic capital enable in other asset classes? That's a kind of an open future area of exploration for Prime. So um, in venture, you know, where, where our view of the world is supporting very uh, early stage, you know, tech heavy uh, startup companies, much of the, the um, type of companies that are here at Greentown Labs, so that's kind of a similar zone as, as the companies that we support. Um, we think about, okay, well, to, to meet the IPCC goals, we know we can get a lot of the way there by deploying existing solutions, but without policy change, we also need to develop new solutions or reduce the cost of existing solutions, and technology innovation is one way that we know for to do that. Um, and um, traditional venture capital is very good at supporting companies that are capital light in nature, that can yield venture-like returns in seven years or so for a 10-year closed-ended fund. Venture is not traditionally great at supporting companies that are gonna require a lot of capital to scale, uh, equipment to manufacture, integration into you know, uh, existing infrastructure, whether those be power plants or um, urban infrastructure or uh, transportation infrastructure and so on. And so what we worry about at Prime is how are we gonna support hardware companies whose technologies we also need to achieve deep decarbonization if their businesses are not a fundamental match for venture capital, which is the riskiest asset class that there is. So there's this, this mismatch. And um, my colleague, Sarah Carney, who I think many of you know, founded Prime based on the, the insight that we could use philanthropic capital for this purpose. And to support companies whose primary, or rather, um, who are serving a social benefit, in this case, uh, mitigating climate change, where we see a pathway towards significant greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction um, that uh, venture capital would not support right now because it's too early or too risky, but for whom we can see a pathway for venture to support after we get involved. So that's what we do. Uh, we support companies that are um, you know, not, a, not a slam dunk fit for traditional venture right now, uh, could yield really significant gigaton scale emissions reduction, and um, and can be de-risked with philanthropic dollars. Um, and so Prime uh, has done this on kind of a syndication base with foundations and family offices for a few years now. We've supported about 10 companies in that way, um, and we now are investing out of the Prime Impact Fund, which is uh, same concept, same types of dollars coming in uh, from foundations and uh, families and individuals and it's supporting the same types of companies, but demonstrating that we can do this um, you know, in, in a standalone fund, which we are now thinking about what will be future iterations of that and, and how can it start to crowd in um, commercial capital sources. And that's what we think about because we know that, um, as, as Lindsay took us through, we need big numbers to move here. So we're always looking for where philanthropic capital can unlock very significant um, amounts of, of commercial capital. Um, a couple of um, other things I'll mention, you know, what we do um, right now with Prime is use philanthropic capital um, just to be concessionary on risk. So this is something we say a lot. We're not actually concessionary on returns. We're concessionary on risk. So we're just embracing more technical risk. There's still an opportunity for capital to come back very meaningfully. Of course, if someone participates in our fund, with charitable capital and that capital is returned, it stays charitable capital, right? So then as a philanthropist, it can be regifted, and that's a wonderful thing. Um, there might be in other um, asset classes, other forms that philanthropic capital could take. We've you know, been started thinking about project finance and debt and you know, if it was, if, whether there's a concessionary component that it would be appropriate for uh, philanthropic capital to take. So again, I look forward to others' ideas but where we are today, um, you know, focusing on early stage venture, I think we're just um, we're full speed ahead on continuing to demonstrate that capital that companies can be supported in an equity-like fashion with this type of capital, which um, you know we, we've seen a lot of momentum toward. Uh, some of the things we're excited about, we have some um, you know kind of higher profile um, folks involved in our fund, including. Hewlett Foundation, Grantham Foundation, Sierra Club Foundation. We also have a ton of others that I think are, you know, not household names, which we're actually super excited about that we're demonstrating this groundswell of, um, of small family foundations that really want to make a difference in this way, um, as well as donor advised funds that we've now worked with, 
many dozens of donor advised fund sponsors um, to help their clients participate in, in the work that we're doing. So we're, we're just tremendously excited about that um, and are actively investing out of our fund now. Our fund is two quarters old, <laughs> so uh, it's very early, but um, uh, we've, uh, we're, we're excited to be making our fourth investment this month and um, um, a group of great companies that we think can really move the needle on climate change. Great. Thanks very much, Joanna. I really appreciate it. So um, as we're beginning to hear, there's a very wide opportunity set across asset classes to invest in solutions to climate change. I mean, that's the, the sort of prima facie observation here. Um, but at the same time, there's a wide spectrum of risk return opportunities, uh, depending on asset classes and the sectors in which people are deploying uh, capital and also where the source of capital um, is found, right, in, in terms of the asset owners, um, whether they be foundations or commercial capital or individuals. Um, so we're beginning to hear about that. And so I think it's really helpful to turn to Ash now from Athena since they work precisely with um, clients, you know, who are eager to deploy capital across this kind of opportunity set to hear how, um, how Athena approaches it and what kind of um, opportunities you're seeing across asset classes. Great. Yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, I really, I'm a big fan of Greentown. Uh, I really like the beer here. <laughs> um, and they do a lot of cool events. Um, so um, I guess I'm going to start a little bit about um, uh, what Athena is, uh, talk about how we're approaching environmental investing um, or investing within environmental lens, uh, and maybe talk about challenges uh, that we see. Um, I know Josh gave me a big responsibility of figuring out how to make a clean, clean portfolio, but it's, it's, it's really difficult uh, because you're optimizing on risk, return, and impact, and what does that mean? Uh, so I think I'm going to throw more questions than answers. Um, uh, so Athena is a, is a wealth management firm, uh, multi-family office with a lot of high net worth individuals and institutions, um, and we build customized uh, portfolios uh, for each of them that are diversified across asset classes. Um, some of the asset classes are ones that are represented on this round table. So if you think about our job, is if you have a hundred dollars, is who, how much of that hundred dollars would you give to the different um, companies or firms represented uh, on this panel? But the problem is there are a lot of breckenridges, trillions, okay. some of <laughs> right, uh, and uh, Prime, so our, our job is to, 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 to talk to all these different players and, and allocate capital or make recommendations on how to make, allocate that capital. Uh, our clients have been making investments, uh, responsible investments, uh, environmentally and socially conscious investments for a while, uh, and they're slowly moving into uh, the environmental space and being much more uh, determined about how to create an impact there. Uh, so we, we, we looked at a lot of uh, opportunities um, for climate change mitigation. That does a landscape, particularly in private markets recently. Uh, and in the top four industries, everyone knows it's energy, transport, buildings, and industry. That really requires a lot of change. Um, uh, and, and we see a lot of uh, opportunities for disruption there coming from uh, technological change, uh, hardware as well as software, uh, regulation, uh, as well as uh, the increasingly recognizable uh, physical and uh, transition risk uh, from climate change. Uh, and uh, but we, we do say we, we're looking at private markets because there's a lot of opportunities, there are a lot of funds that are opening up, uh, but I think as Elizabeth was mentioning, a uh, lot of big corporates uh, are starting to move this space. So, although maybe the, their solution space uh, revenue uh, coming from them might be like 10% or 20%, that is still meaningful. Uh, so, it's helpful to move beyond just pure play uh, and look at kind of these diversified companies as well. Uh, and, and to Peter's point, I do agree with you. I think the fixed income guys are going to get this one. Anyone else? Uh, maybe to close out with some challenges. Um, as I was saying, if you're optimizing across risk, return, and impact, risk and return, maybe you can compare across asset classes. Impact is very difficult. Maybe you can say there's a carbon yield or 
carbon abatement yield, uh, but how uh, Trillium uh, measures it versus how, how Johanna uh, measures it, which is yours is much more forward-looking, whereas yours is existing. How do you compare that and how do you put it together in a portfolio? That's difficult. Um, and I do think there's a need to move beyond just a number. Uh, this is a conversation we hear a lot in gender lens investing, uh, but I think it also needs to come in environmental lens investing, uh, moving beyond just carbon emissions, because there's deep fundamental changes required in the economy. So how do you think about that? What are the measures to think about that? We're thinking about transportation and electrifying transportation, but it's still changing the same old single-use vehicle models and changing that. Um, uh, and turning it off to find those. Uh, and I guess, uh, f finally, I know that I said there's a lot of breaking and and, uh, and and Prime and, and Sunwealth as well, but I think there, there still needs to be a stronger pipeline. Uh, more people still need to come into this space uh, and bring much more rigor from both the financial side as well as the scientific and legal side uh, to, to get, get better at these strategies. Great. Thank you, Ash. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all of our roundtable contributors for these thoughtful introductory reflections. Um, I'm going to start with Ash, actually, um, since his remarks are the most capacious when it comes to the full portfolio. And um, indeed, he's left us with a series of challenges and questions that I think are precisely the kind of things that we hope to, to foster first among just our roundtable participants and then to open up to the rest of us here in the in the room, as well as those of you who are online. Um, so um, I'd like to begin with uh, the proposition around um, the total portfolio um, and, and several, you know, several emphasis on drawing from your remarks, right? So total portfolio activation is our mantra um, at the Institute and, and for other practitioners in the field increasingly so, where there's an opportunity set, um, at least to think about it in, in that frame. And so one point you made um, rightly, Ash, is that um, impact looks different in different asset classes. And indeed, I, I think we often intuitively understand that, but if I may say so, just take the liberty um, to probe that a bit more fully um, in a critical spirit, um, I think we may want to recognize some of the challenges that lead one to, I think the conclusions that Prime is making for certain kinds of asset classes, that there may need to be um, you know, philanthropic interventions to support certain parts of markets that clearly are not registering all this, as Peter suggested, too. Um, and why is that? It's because uh, it seems to me that the framework that many of us are operating under, um, including most, you know, advisors, is modern portfolio theory, right? And so the basic premise there is that portfolios are diversified um, radically across asset classes and across the investable universe. Um, if you take it even further, the, the sort of premises of modern portfolio theory as they've been applied in the institutional investor space in particular, uh, it would be the endowment model of investing, right? David Swenson, pioneer um, at Yale University. And what that means is that there's an equity risk premium that, that, that a long-term investor has the opportunity to seize. And um, that's an intriguing proposition for a lot of institutional investors who often do have a long-term investment horizon. And one would think given the long-term challenges of climate change, that there would be a lovely harmony between a long-term sustainable investing perspective and quite literally a perpetual investment horizon on the part of a college endowment, right? Indeed, college endowments like at Yale or others in the neighborhood here um, across, across an invisible border. Um, <laughs> endowments that are older than the history of the United States of America, right? Um, and yet, it doesn't seem to be the case for some reason. That the lesson drawn within the endowment model investing about risk is not so much about the social risk or the risk of climate change. It's simply the fact that because we're a long-term investor, we can stomach volatility in the short term. Now, of course, the problem, as many of us experienced a decade ago, is that sometimes when you're only operating on the conception of risk measured in terms of volatility of price, we actually are disregarding a lot of the social and environmental risks that all of us, I think, in this room are trying to grapple with. And in doing so, we actually 
misunderstand the nature of an asset class, and suddenly everything is correlated when they're supposed to be uncorrelated because we haven't really defined the asset class to the specificity of, specificity of its social or environmental function, meaning you invest in real estate because you want to house people or you want to create buildings in which we have entrepreneurial innovation, or you invest in farmland, not because of a double-digit annualized return, because you want to feed people or clothe people, or you invest in timberlands, so you can have working landscapes, you invest in publicly traded companies, right, because you want to support companies that are creating products and services we need um, and it's not just the historical risk return profile. So if people are kind of following me here a bit, there's a kind of paradox that we have between principals and agents, between asset owners and asset managers, particularly those who are being more thoughtful about it. So I, gotta, I wanna begin by opening up the conversation with the roundtable participants along those lines, and that is to say, to Ash's point, he's a little concerned about the, the asymmetry of impact. And so I wondered if each of our roundtable participants could talk a little bit about the impact that they see they're, they're deriving from, from the exposures that they're providing to their clients. Um, and maybe in Lindsay's case, since she's not a fund manager in the way that the other panelists are, um, if you wouldn't mind giving voice to some of the diversity of asset owners who I think are, are grappling with this long-term perspective, right? And drawing different conclusions, some of which you know, is supportive of advancing this problem other cases only weekly so and maybe need philanthropic capital or credit enhancements or something to get this stuff done backstopping as you described from neighbors um so i'm kind of curious about that if we could just kind of walk through each of the asset classes and get your take on the impact opportunity in particular um and if i can put liz on the spot first <laughs> just since that's kind of how we we had the conversation from public markets to private markets i think that might be interesting because there was a I'm drawing an inference that you can't have so much impact in the public markets I hear, but then we also talked about engagement, and that's where quantifiable impact actually can be tracked if only we have a system for doing so. So we'll start with you, Liz, and then we'll kind of go right back through the panel around this question of the impact that you see in your, your asset class around renewable energy opportunities. Sure. Um, so when we talk about impact and when we report on impact for our products, which we do, um, there, there are a few different ways. Um, the one I think, I think Peter had mentioned that you can report on, you know, this, this fund or this strategy had a carbon footprint that was X percent lower than its benchmark, um, which in itself is, is laudable, uh, but you're right, a lot of the work that we do is around engagement. Uh, one of the things Chilean is known for is our uh, our engagement team. We have, have four professionals whose job is to um, to pester companies and to bug them and to say, you're not thinking about the future. You are really worried about next quarter or maybe next year if we're going to be generous here, but you're not looking at these societal changes that are coming down the road in a decade or two decades. So how are you going to get ready for them? So that's what our, our, a lot of our advocacy work is around. How are you maximizing your workforce? How are you retaining your workforce? How are you thinking about your energy needs in the future? So we've done a lot of work, as I mentioned earlier, around um, urging corporations to sign these power purchase agreements. Guess what? We're not really doing so much of that work anymore because it's been proven out economically. Uh, so we had a, a lot of success with that a few years ago, and that idea has really caught on. Uh, some of the companies that we had been urging to do it were some of the leaders doing so and so now they've got that energy stream lined up for the future uh, and many of their peers are saying oh that's that's an economic pro proposition i'm going to do that too um so you know i think there um you could stay within the public equity markets like oh are you really having impact uh but but we think there is a lot to be said they're using that investor voice the investor vote that we have uh, to vote our proxies on the resolutions which we and many of our uh, our colleagues in Boston and around the world uh, have filed and put on the, um, the proxy statements of these companies. But also, really, it's the act of letting people know also, I think, uh, what's in their portfolios. And so reporting that carbon footprint, which, you know, might not seem to be a big thing, but it is. I mean, how many mutual funds out there give you that carbon footprint um, without being prodded to do so by some of the data providers? And there's more and more data providers that are giving that information, the new ones say, I believe. Uh, and so with that information out there, you can start looking around and investors have the opportunity to judge, judge their managers and to think about what's my portfolio 
portfolio, what is this particular portfolio, in this case an equity portfolio, how are they prepared for the future? Because when you think about, pick on Yale for a moment, uh, where I have a, a master's degree from, and they, they choose not to divest, and they're actually like arresting their students who are begging them to divest. And I've worked with a lot of students from different schools that are trying to urge their universities to divest their portfolios, because Josh is right, these schools hopefully are going to be there for hundreds more years. Can their endowments stand to have fossil fuels in their endowments for hundreds of years? No, that's a ridiculous proposition. I think many of us around this table would agree. So it is time to start using the equity portfolio in particular uh, as a way to bring in some of these other opportunities and start thinking about them. Peter, fixed income impact, <laughs> public markets, what are you financing that can, can be attributed back to the investors? Some piece of this action. Um, well, um, there's a few things I want to say, so I'm going to get to that. <laughs> I, just, I just want to jump on the, because uh, um, whenever anybody talks about modern portfolio theory, it gets my blood up. Uh, I get uh, so frustrated because I think it's wrought so many um, ills. Um, but broader than that, I mean, it's, it's all um, sort of this market fundamentalism that markets are rational and all-knowing and efficient. Um, good Lord. I mean, from what we've seen over the last 20 years, who can say that with a straight face? And so, um, and, and of course, um, as I said earlier, you know, there is this, uh, there is a market failure at some level that, you know, in this, the, all this short-termism that investors and, and markets are, are not, are ignoring longer-term challenges and risks. So, um, I do, you know, again, back to the fixed income. It sounds very self-serving, but I, you know, it's, it, it applies to any fixed income investor and manager. Um, where's the one asset class that you're a little less beholden to market, right? Where's um, you know, it, it's fixed income, um, where I actually feel as a fiduciary investor an obligation uh, to look beyond markets because my highest responsibility, again, is, you know, safety of principle and interest. And uh, if ultimately, I think that's in jeopardy um, because a, a company or a municipality is ignoring um, serious risk. Then, um, and I think it's incumbent on me to respond to that. So a little bit about the impact. Um, I think the exciting thing that we've found when we're investing a lot of, uh, most of the portfolios we invest are not corporate bond portfolios, but actually municipal bond portfolios. And the tough thing about a municipality is you're stuck. Like with your geography, you can't move your supply chain off to somewhere else and export their pollution or whatever. Um, so, uh, so municipalities, um, and a lot of them have to worry about um, coastal vulnerability and sea level rise. A lot of them have to worry about you know, extreme heat or extreme weather. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of good data that we're getting from companies, vendors that uh, are really for the insurance industries and others are starting to um, to uh, report and collect this and and so we can really use it and um, we are I mean it 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 um, if you talk to a small little coastal community and they've um, not made if they have no um, coastal resiliency or um, assessment uh, or um, anything to anything that they can talk about. I mean, that is alarming to us. And so with, across this spectrum in the public markets, I do think uh, the municipal bond market is likely going to be one that quickly sort of punishes and rewards uh, communities that have um, begin to address these issues. So, um, so that, you know, it's, 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 um, it'll be measured in, in market returns and performance, but, um, uh, and, but there are good systems out there helping us to sort of quantify this. That's helpful. So before going into the price,
private market side, I wondered if I could turn to Lindsay just as a kind of hinge here as we shift from, from public back to private um, to get a sense of, you know, series uh, series members, the investor network kind of points of view because obviously extremely diverse in terms of scale as well as <laughs> geography and fiduciary responsibility, right? Foundations don't operate under the same fiduciary responsibility as the college endowment or a pension fund or the other kinds of members that, that you have. Um, so could you sort of opine on this impact question among series members? Sure. So, um couple of points I want to focus on just to round out in particular the, um, the public uh, markets actually uh, through line that we have here from all of uh, network members. But before getting to that, I did want to acknowledge too to the endowment management question, um, our partner for CSAI, IEN. Um, and we have Hannah uh, Bowen here uh, in the room today. So IEN uh, has recently released a new endowment roadmap, so looking at kind of driving towards sustainable investing and ESG integration. Just wanted to flag that as a great resource. A um, little bit of a, a tangent um, here to our conversation today, more focused on the renewable energy side, but just as we look at endowment management, great resource um, for the sector and for, of course, um, academic endowments in uh, particular. So uh, in terms of uh, looking at public markets, as one of the areas where series has long concentrated and, and many of our members have uh, really is on the shareholder engagement and stakeholder engagement side. So I just, just want to touch on that briefly, building on the comments from Liz and Peter. Um, and, and worth noting that one of the really many topics that we focus on through uh, our shareholder uh, initiative on climate and sustainability, or six, which has uh, really been run for about two decades now, um, co-chaired by Ceres and, and our partners. Uh, so among those topics, renewable energy and energy efficiency, in terms of corporate uh, renewable energy procurement really is gaining ground in recent years. So that has become a, a greater and greater focus. And I think it just underlines the fact we are taking a lot about the investor approach today, but that um, certainly is a big part of it. Uh, and really this is a, a multi-sector, multi-actor approach uh, to, to reaching those goals. So I did want to highlight uh, that another way that we're looking at it uh, across kind of that investor corporate dialogue, which is really critical, uh, is looking at uh, exactly that, looking at kind of ESG disclosure and looking at uh, different types of sustainability uh, disclosures from public companies in particular. As a series just recently released a new report to that effect called Change the Conversation and really looking to make that more of a proactive two-way conversation rather than more of a reactive one. Um, and I think there are certainly different challenges uh, facing companies, public companies on disclosure, and certainly many new frameworks that have been released in recent years. Series was very active, um, for example, in the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD, as set up by former Mayor of Bloomberg and Mark Carney, um, the Bank of England. So uh, looking at kind of those sorts of efforts, I think that is a, a critical piece of it in terms of when we talk about uh, driving impact and really driving towards more of a renewable energy investment and low carbon transition. And then the final just overarching point, and calling on a, a couple of other of our members of our network, uh, just again, retrospectively, as, as one of the, I guess, older institutions um, that happens to be at the table here today, uh, looking back over the 30 years of series history, uh, very much when series was founded, it was to counter the idea that climate risk, that sustainability risk are off balance sheet risks. They're, they're clearly not. Um, and just looking at this sea change, maybe not in capital transition yet, unfortunately, as we've seen in the BNEF numbers, but certainly in terms of investor awareness. And just this past Friday in the New York Times, uh, there was an article to that effect in that as we look at driving impact across different asset classes, I think one of the key drivers um, is really both on an institutional and individual perspective that investors are really looking for this information and this progress. Um, and we see that in kind of the millennials, especially as we look at rolling there but really across the board, um, the two of our members have quoted in that article at Green Century Capital Management and then Wellington Management, uh, which has newly joined the series investor network, just underlining that trend. And I think as we look at impact um, across asset classes, across sectors, across that investor corporate dialogue, I think that certainly uh, is a very positive tailwind going forward. Great. Um, so shifting quickly to the private markets, then, John, if you might like to um, respond to the impact opportunity you've already touched upon also this nexus back to social equity community resilience and and um, community engagement and I wonder if you could um, 
keep that in mind here to shift the conversation in that direction. Uh, I also just want to do a time check. There are quarter past three right now, and our aim is to finish at 3.30. So what, least, at least the webinar portion. For the webinar portion. So what I may do at, after um, John and, and uh, Johanna respond to the impact question, that we may turn it over to some questions that we're getting from the webinar. So if you do have any questions, those of you on the webinar, um, please use the chat box to um, present those. And my colleague, Christy Electris, can, um, can pose uh, some of those and at least get them on the table. For those of you who are in person or sticking around, we're happy to kind of close the webinar and continue the dialogue in person for a few minutes before we go get drinks and do a, do the tour. The tour doesn't start until 4.30. Um, so let's just do that in consideration for those of you who are dialing in. Um, so turn it over to John. Sure. So um, what we offer to our investors is both uncorrelated asset classes, but also incremental impact. And we count that incremental impact in a couple ways. When we look at the solar market and its growth and where it's heading, is residential is going like this, large commercial and utility scale is going like this. And the underserved middle market has been relatively stagnant. So as a solar project developer, I could drive by certain areas and look at fields and rooftops and say, there's going to be solar on that. I didn't need to do anything to make that happen. But you can also look at certain rooftops and they'll Hmm. Traditional investors don't like those projects because they're small, they may have perceptions, false perceptions around the credit behind the off-taker on those projects, and that's where SunWealth comes in. And what we are able to do is make an incremental impact, not just around carbon reduction, but around who gets to install those solar projects. Typically, small businesses have a hard time getting underwritten by traditional financing, creating jobs for them. Entities. And then the other thing, which is core to our underwriting and to our business, is that we underwrite and model each deal so that all of our customers or energy off takers or hosts get clear and meaningful energy savings, whether it's the Epiphany School or Equinix and everyone in between on those projects. So Jeff just texted me some stats, of course. <laughs> so, you know, last year we invested $15 million and we can empirically model that that's going to provide our energy customers with $9 million in savings. So think of that. For every dollar that someone invests in us, more than 50 cents goes to create energy savings for great community organizations. That also creates $12 million in revenue for our local installation partners. And it's 185 job years that are created over the life of this project. And it's also 140,000 metric tons of carbon reduction. And people say, well, how, how do you know all this? And we are fortunate enough that solar is one of the easiest things to measure. We can count jobs and we can measure kilowatt hours in real time just logging into the system on the roof. A, it's pretty straightforward to model production from a solar project. It's you know, not rocket scientists, though. So rocket scientists have developed the models. <laughs> <laughs> and over time, it's easy <laughs> to monitor it as well. And we know with our track record and our experience beforehand that there's, you know, basically we're on track to meet all of our models on all these projects. That's great. That's really helpful within you know, the project finance space. Um, again, both private debt and, and tax equity financing. Johanna, on the film topic side. Sure, and I'll, I'll try to be quick. I know we're trying to get to questions. So um, first in terms of venture capital in general on the impact question. So a question that often gets asked at panels with VC types around uh, who are impact investors is, can you have both impact and returns? It's kind of like this popular question. And it's, it's, you know, it's a little silly because I think the answer is definitely yes. Many people have demonstrated that. Where what, the reason I find it frustrating is because from a climate perspective, it, it's not necessarily the right question because you can have impact. You, can, you as a venture investor can demonstrate great returns to your LPs and be having some impact, but whether or not it's optimal impact and like what the climate needs is a separate question. And so I think where the venture capital class needs to really grow up around impact is evaluating, you know, is this where we can have the most impact? Um, you know, am I, and that's something that we are actually fortunate in having a philanthropic angle we not only can ask that, but feel it's our duty to ask, are we doing, are we investing in something that would actually 
that is optimally impactful and would not happen without us. Um, and so I'm not suggesting that, you know, that that exact lens can be applied to other venture funds, but I think what's lacking is that, that eye toward optimal impact because, uh, in my opinion, if what we care about is, you know, greenhouse gas emissions reduction, it's not enough to just say, am I having an impact? I mean, we can do better than that. Um, in terms of what we provide to our investors and how we evaluate impact, it's really on a per company basis. So when we're evaluating uh, an early stage company for potential uh, seed or Series A investment, we'll look at their the, the product that is envisioned to be offered. And this is always very forward looking for us, as, as Ash alluded to, uh, because these companies are way, way pre-deployment, pre-revenue. Um, and so we'll evaluate, you know, if this company is successful, so a good example, an air conditioning company that we supported called Tro, um, who uh, has a novel heat exchanger material in their air conditioner, which can be not only much more efficient, but allows them to construct an air conditioner that has water cooling instead of very high emitting refrigerants that leaks and, and uh, emits to the atmosphere. So um, we can say, well, for every air conditioner deployed when this company starts to deploy to customers, you know, this is the envisioned avoided uh, GHG impact. Uh, and then we model that out and evaluate, you know, here's how many uh, in, in developing markets, here's we'll be buying air conditioners and so on. Um, subtract off what we think will happen anyway based on, um, you know, the, the regulations around around these units, um, and only if we see a pathway toward gigaton scale impact, after doing all that modeling, will we then proceed to make an investment. And so, and you know, we're very transparent about that, and our investors can have that confidence. And then that also becomes kind of our guide once we invest in a company and we sit on the board. We're evaluating them on that basis, and we're evaluating ourselves on that basis. Are we shepherding this company to a point where they're deploying this product that we envision could have this type of impact? Um, and, and that's part of the reporting that we provide back to our investors. Great, it's really helpful. So with about 10 minutes left in the webinar portion, I wondered if I could turn it over to our, our team to see if there are any questions coming in. Not, not yet, I think no? we're waiting to okay. do the discussion. Well, with that, um, I would like to open it up to the in-person um, the audience here um, to join join this conversation more deeply. Um And uh, I don't know who you are, please announce yourself. Um, so would anybody like to pose a question to bring into the discussion here? Yes. Say who you are, please. Hi, so I just want to make a question. Um, just back to like what you were mentioning about you know, like moving from asset classes to more like impact classes, you know, if we go that direction, how would each of the panelists, you know, like describe their impact mm -hmm. classes? Would we should think the portfolio allocation, you know, and modern portfolio theory into Rethinking, you know, like impact classes. What What are your thoughts on that, and how would each one of them like fit into impact classes? Great. Rather than take each individual question, I'd like to get a, a whole series of questions on the table. That way, we can kind of bundle in and reflect accordingly. Um, so, other questions, please. Tori Dietelhoff with Beetle and Partners. Um, Jonathan, you really spoke to sort of the social justice externalities and the pieces that you're working on. I'd be curious to hear from the rest of you whether you're hearing from your investors, whether people are asking about how are you thinking about other social justice outcomes and we'll speak about impact. Thank you. Other folks? Anything on the Zoom? I do have a couple on the Zoom now. Yeah, go ahead. Um, from uh, Christina Herman, financial support for a transition to a clean energy economy is extremely important, so she thanks us for the gathering uh, and the work we're doing. ICCR is looking at just transition issues and trying to understand how to ensure transition is good for communities and workers, and, um, and they're concerned about lower wages and health and safety standards in the renewable energy industry, because so if folks could comment on that as well. Specifically, what investors are making um, Clean energy of investments. What investors making clean energy investments can do to promote a just transition? Any others? Just to get them on the table. Yeah. So one other one, building upon that, since Tori's asked uh, along these lines, Christina sort of amplified the point. I think uh, in our collective discussion uh, prior to the roundtable, uh, a question emerged uh, even more pointedly um, around the degree to which the clean energy transition or the clean energy revolution may in fact be magnifying social inequality in some respects rather than actually, you know, um, tempering it. Um, to say nothing of actually 
flipping it <laughs> and addressing it explicitly. So I wonder if folks have at the class rooted observations around uh, around that. Um, so um, yeah, we've got a series of questions on the table. So um, kind of curious, I might. Ash, do you, just because it's been a while since you've intervened in the conversation, <laughs> would you like to start? Um, I would say, no, I don't think this issue of just transition has been clearly brought out yet. Um, and I know professors are working on getting satellite imagery to figure out if there is a systematic way in which disenfranchised communities are not getting solar, but I don't think that has been communicated to a broader uh, group yet. Um, on uh, asset classes, impact asset classes. I would say uh, on the financial side, there are some investors that are starting to break their portfolios down based on risk factors. Uh, there can be a potential impact overlay on top of that, but uh, we are starting to ask these questions with our public equity managers who are saying we have these thematic allocations um, in our portfolio. So then the natural question would be, if you are, then okay, so I can measure it across time with the correlations of these impact uh, themes uh, that, that, you, that, that you do, and there's not a clear answer. Mm. That's interesting. Others, without any particular order, just uh, based on some of what you've heard. I, yeah, Liz, please. I so. Um, so, I think maybe tying many of these questions together, uh, I like where you started the question about thinking about impact classes, and if you take a step away from whatever the definition of impact classes is, if such a thing exists. Um, so personally for me, the way that I got interested in this, this whole field back when, back when I was a youngster in school was thinking, okay, the climate is changing and big businesses broadly caused this problem. They're going to have to solve it. How can I dedicate my career to that? Um, and so one of the answers certainly is um, you know, investing in the companies that are providing the solutions. But another uh, way of, of contributing to that solution is through the work that Trillium's advocacy team does, as I was mentioning earlier, making companies who have caused problems, broadly speaking, cause solutions, broadly speaking. So depending on how you think about asset, uh, about impact classification, uh, you know, if you're thinking from the top level, you know, these corporations that are employing, when you think about the public equity markets, the corporations that are employing so many people, how can we uh, get them to contribute? And so, you know, one of the things that we think about at Trillium is that you can't just look at one factor in isolation. You can't look at just climate change. You can't have just a gender lens. You have to think about the whole thing together. Um, so one of the areas that we are interested in is human capital management. So when you've got corporations that you could imagine a corporation who is providing, you know, the ultimate renewable energy, say like the, the world's best solar panel, but, but treating their employees quite terribly. Um, and so we would say that's not just, let's do some work, let's pester this company and get them to improve. Uh, before we even invested, if we would invest, we'd be looking at how they, they treat their workers. That's one of the reasons that we do a lot of work around um, reporting on workforce composition, for example. So just trying to think about how how we need corporations to look and to work in order to, to solve these, these global problems and trying to do it all within the same framework. Peter, sticking in the public markets, do you have a reaction to some of that? Um, well, um, when, so we tried to, um, I mean, not measure, but categorized or sector by impact, um, mostly the SDGs, which I sort of had this lovely relationship with. But, um, but I do think on the municipal um, issuer side, very often those purposes do, these projects do align with an impact which aligns with um, a sustainable development goal. So we've done that. Um, and, uh, and then we just, you know, we've really struggled with reporting and trying to um, give investors a clear, I mean, we do think that ESG integration ultimately it's done well and, and broadly adapted. That's the holy grail in that, you know, we get management's will, <coughs> management of companies will, um, you know, they will, 
respond if to uh, an issue if the markets respond to it. Um, the problem is markets and investors aren't. So that um, that we do a lot of work, you know, to better. I mean, we're reporting because we used to hand people portfolios, and we do a lot of work in our security selection, um, taking account of ESG and, and impact, and then we just hand them the portfolio, and that doesn't suffice. So we've done a lot of work to give them more data and, and more commentary on each of our holdings. So I think transparency is a good, um, that's been our strategy. Yeah, that's helpful. So swinging to the private markets um, to conclude, um, yeah, maybe Johanna first. Sure. A um, <clears throat> couple of quick thoughts. I love the question around impact class. There's maybe two ways to think about stratifying it. One would be based on additionality. So, you know, the extent to which something would be done on its own with the with the markets without an impact lens versus the extent to something that something would not be done. Um, <clears throat> similar but different uh, would be just around an, you know, op optimal impact and of course to do that you need to you can only do that if if you decide on a metric to prioritize and you know what I'm hearing around the table is that that's challenging in many portfolios I think with a very focused fund like ours we're comfortable doing that where where our first filter is potential for GHG emission reduction and then underneath that you know when we in the fullness of considering an investment we'll we'll think about other factors like water impacts or community impacts or um, um, diversity impacts and that kind of thing. Um, so those would be, yeah, two, two approaches I might pose. John? Sure. So in terms of class, I think that the way I'd answer this question is that we need to think really hard about how we define impact investing. And right now there's a huge amount of asset classes and types of investment that are included under it. I would make an argument that for us to be successful at impact investing, that at least a generation from now, it needs to be both walking and chewing bubble gum at the same time. So it can't just be about carbon mitigation. It should be about carbon mitigation plus addressing social issues at the same time. And then, you know, clean energy transition magnifying perpetuating social injustice. That is a loaded question. I had tons of empirical. <laughs> Evidence saying, yes, it absolutely is. One of the main ones I can quote is, here in Massachusetts, we take great pride in our community solar programs and the amount of penetration it's gotten in the market. So, you know, approximately 30, 40% of all the solar in the state is supported by community solar. And here's what's interesting is that show me one of those community solar customers that has a FICO score less than 700, and I'll be impressed. And so there is huge perpetuation of social injustice in the way we develop projects, the way we finance them, the way we do this. Solar is good. All solar is good. But we can do a little bit better. Oh. And, uh, not, to, not to pitch on the spot, but I think you have the last word here. Um, again, from a multi-asset class and asset owning perspective and, and as an important field builder in the space. I guess in sequentially, I guess just addressing um, whether we are um, seeing focus from our investor network, and I would say also our, our company network, um, which is very interwoven uh, in terms of, uh, kind of the, the S of ESG and looking at just transition, I would say definitely the answer to that is yes. Um, and to the extent that we've actually set up a new working group, uh, the just transition working group, um, that is a result of that increasing investor interest. One. Um, beyond Boston for a, a moment, one issue that has really come to the forefront is on our company network side in particular is looking at uh, issues of forced labor uh, and supply chains um, and human rights abuses. So that's, those are uh, beyond our traditional climate focus, but certainly very related in many ways, um, issues that, that series is, is working to address. And then I guess in the overarching uh, framework or, or reclassification uh, question, um, to, to Peter's point, I think we're also seeing a uh, increasing interest in the UNSDGs and investor focus there. I think that the positive of that um, is that there's a, a common framework and kind of a language. That one of the challenges of that is that they're not necessarily constructed. To say all of them, uh, this is seventeen to be uh, it's granular and then so there's certainly a lot of challenge 
around that, as well as concern about possible um, uh, SDG washing, which um, <laughs> is, is uh, yeah. uh, you know key to look at uh, as well. Um, but what we are seeing increased uh, interest there, and, and certainly a lot of conversation around uh, those 17 goals. Um, and uh, so I think that's that's something that we'll continue to see going forward. Um, it, in terms of uh, kind of tying it all together uh, across asset classes, I think what we're seeing uh, really is that, um, and I think we saw this in the numbers in terms of renewable energy investment, is that uh, progress is not necessarily uh, linear year over year in terms of renewable energy. Um, and one topic we haven't talked about today, but I know Greentown has done some uh, great events on, is also uh, the policy landscape. The series is working across a number of different uh, states, in particular in terms of really leveling that playing field, and that certainly is a, a critical piece of, of the equation from both the investor and, and corporate dimension. Super. I think that's a great place to, to finish because policy is exactly one of those those issues where every investor, regardless of asset class, has an opportunity to engage and to see really important impacts associated with that because regulation plays just an immensely important role in a renewable energy economy. Um, so with that, I know we're just uh, beyond our time here at the bottom of the hour, so I, I would like to draw the webinar portion of this to a close. And, and um, just, you, know, you might want to advance the last slide if folks would like to be in touch uh, with the Croatan Institute team about this and, and future events that the Clean Portfolio Project um, will be doing. We'd love for you to reach out to us um, in that vein. Um, and let me just conclude again by thanking John and his team at Sunwell, Jess Brooks in particular, um, who I know isn't here, but um, uh, Jess and Ryan for, for facilitating uh, this, uh, this setting really, really dynamic and great. We really appreciate it. Thanks again to Greentown Labs. I also want to thank my other team members who are here. Bill Harrington is here, a senior fellow from New York, the electress who's behind the camera, and Jamie Silverstein, um, also an associate on the Crow 10 team here in the Boston area. So thanks, everyone. And with that, um, we're going to conclude. Yes, we'll conclude the webinar portion. And um, just for those that are on the line, there will be slides, and we can share with everyone um, slides and the recording once that's